Welcome to the C Word, the Conservatives podcast. Today we're talking about professional bodies. I'm Jenny Mathiasen, an objects conservator based in South Yorkshire. And I'm Chloe Rumsey, an objects conservator based in Greater Manchester. And today it's just the two of us. Just us. Aww. Aww. No, it's not so bad. <laughs> There's pizza. It's nice. Snowy. There's a lot of snow. You really braved the snow today. Well, I don't know. You? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, just to start with, um, this episode about professional bodies is actually Christina's brainchild. Shout, Shout out. out. Thank you so much for your hard work, Christina. Right. So we're we unfortunately having to having to do this episode without Christina, which is a bit, which is a bit of a shame, really. But uh, we are go- going to have a smashing time of it, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Obviously. First, a bit of jovial news. I recently, I'm really into video games. <laughs> <laughs> so I watched a lot of video game reviews because I'm a massive nerd. And uh, recently I watched a review of uh, an expansion pack for The Sims 4. Now, for people who have lived under a rock or aren't familiar with video games. Whichever, or normal people. Whichever one that is. <laughs> whichever one you can't just have as. Uh, the Sims is a series of games which are basically kind of like virtual dollhouses. You build some houses, you make some people, you dress them up and you play with them, right? That's that, that's the premise. <laughs> uh, they have jobs and stuff and all that, all the good stuff. Basically, it's a virtual dollhouse and it's been going for quite some time. So now they're on The Sims 4 and there's an expansion pack for that called Jungle Adventure. And... Uh, in it, in a slightly sketchy way, because you're a tourist, uh, your Sims can become archaeologists and dig things out of the ground, which I find quite, you know, enticing. <laughs> um, but or more... unethical, whichever. Yes, I was going to say, also massively illegal. Uh, <laughs> even better, if you have the right, if your Sim has the right skill set and the right equipment, they can clean up the artifacts and do <laughs> conservation work. <laughs> And then they go in a special cabinet in their house. Again, super illegal and unethical. But in theory, conservation is in some way represented in a video game. And I'm excited. <laughs> anyway, that was a massive, <laughs> massive tangent. Uh, but that's our only news today. <laughs> Back to the series matter. Oh, raining it in. So today we're talking about professional bodies. And um, there are loads. There are loads. I don't think I realised... <laughs> No, many there once are. we started making a list and actually emailing everyone, it started becoming apparent there are a lot of professional bodies out there. We went for national, international, we went for a couple of specialty groups, like specialist networks. We we really did try to talk to everyone. Uh, not everyone had time to talk to us, but we are very... Just fair enough. Really. Yeah, we really appreciate the people who did take the time to get back to us. Thank you so much, everyone. Who... Oh, yeah did respond and responded very comprehensively as well oh yeah you were we awesome. so impressed with all of your replies we're and we'll thank everyone individually at the end oh yes definitely now just as a starter uh, a professional body also known as a professional association society or organization is an organization seeking to further a particular profession the interests of the individuals engaged in that profession and the public interest and they tend to be non-profit organizations just as a Wikipedia <laughs> definition of what we're doing, like what we're on about. To begin, a, to oh, begin yes. with, because it's, it's a bit muddled, isn't it? Like, what is a professional body? What yeah. is a one? And yeah, but um, actually, I think I think specialist networks totally count because they are trying to do something very much for people who work with that specific yeah. thing. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So I think yeah. that totally counts as a professional body. But yeah, so we asked loads of people uh how many people actually got back to us do you remember nine 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 we had nine very nine organizations. Compre- comprehensive replies uh which and is from awesome. one organization two people two separate people got back to me oh very good very nice oh, it looks very nice yeah that is very nice so the organizations we have and i'm going to rattle through these and explain what they are because there are a lot of abbreviations and i'm really sorry i feel like there should be some sort of bingo card <laughs> for how many times <laughs> we are going to mention the abbreviations so <laughs> If you need to take notes, take them now. Right. Get a pen. Yeah. So we have ICON, that's the Institute of Conservation. That's the UK body for conservators in the UK. The AIC, the American Institute of Conservation. ICRI, which is what, what, how I say it, sorry, the I-C-R-I, which is longer to say, so I'll go ICRI, uh, which is Institute <laughs> of Conservative Restorers in Ireland. NATSCA, which is the Natural Sciences Collections Association. 
NZCCM, which is the New Zealand Conservators of Cultural Materials. The MA, uh, that's the Museums Association. Again, that's a UK organisation. The NKFS, that's uh, Nordiska Konservatorsförbundet Sverige. Also <laughs> known as the Nordic Conservative Restorers Association in Sweden. Uh, so they have different branches. Finland has its own one, Denmark oh. has its own one, Norway has its own one. But the Swedish ones, they go back to us, which I'm oh, very grateful for. It's a very beautiful word. Oh, thanks very much. Better than ours. <laughs> uh, then we got uh, CAPC, that's uh, Canadian Association of Professional Con- uh, Conservators. And finally, we have ICOMCC, the International Council of Museums Committee for Conservation. That is a, a long and a quite illustrious list, I feel. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Right. What, what are we going to start with? Basically, we sent uh, out basically the same questions to everyone with slight tweaks. And uh, we, we, you know, we got answers to as many or as few of them as people wanted or had time. Quite with. a lot, though. I was really surprised. Oh yeah. Oh no, people went all in with answering. Yeah. I was really impressed. Uh, so, so that's grand. Uh, what should we start with? Uh, press compression. Oh yes. So, I mean, I feel like this is almost a little bit unfair because we're not really talking about what they're offering at this stage. We're just doing a price comparison. I also apologize because ICOM CC isn't included in this little overview because I think I understand this correctly, that each country has a different membership fee. And then I'm not sure if that's a different one for joining ICOM CC on top of that. I'm really, I'm sorry, I'm really bad at confusing membership fee structures. And I get very easily confused. So <laughs> if you understand the process better than we do, please let us know. Please yeah. write in and tell us exactly how it works. Because, I mean, frankly, I'd quite like to join myself. So yeah. it'd be very nice to know this how is... and what and how much. Yeah. So this is where it becomes very obvious that neither one of us is a member of ICOM CC Whoops. because we, 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 we don't know. We have no idea. Um so that's excluded from this, I'm afraid. But basically, I've done some conversions based on the, uh, let's see, the the exchange rate for British pounds on the 18th of March. That's what we're going on here. Um, <laughs> May that not change too dramatically. <laughs> yes, we'll see. So that's a caveat, right? It's today's exchange rate. It could change massively. And I have rounded up or down as appropriate. I'm kind of pleased to say that most places offer kind of a range of prices depending on where you are in your career, etc. Oh, that's good. I quite like that. The only ones that don't is the Canadian Association. Uh, okay. uh, they have a flat fee of 85 Canadian dollars and that's about 46 pounds, which, oh. you know, is, is that, that's pretty good. Is this annually? Yes. Annually. So okay. all of these prices are annual as far as I've been able to tell. In uh, the Swedish Nordic one, full membership is about £39. And associate membership, which I'm not entirely sure what that entails, is £30. And if you're retired, you only pay £13. Oh, uh, which, bargain. Yeah, I know, right? That's really good. <laughs> no, it's so good because previously, before I started looking at this, I felt like retired people tended to be excluded from these tiers. Uh-huh. Like, and actually, I'm heartened to see that they are included more more often than I thought. That's really good. But I do feel like retired people get you know, really, you know, they get the short end of the stick sometimes where it's yeah. like, well, tough, you should have saved more. No, that's not how retirement works anymore. Stop that. Like, well, don't there are also punish, some don't of the punish most... people for retiring. No, exactly. They're also in this, in professions like this, they can be some of the most valuable people oh, to yeah. the profession because they're the ones with all the experience. They're the ones that yeah. have kind of paved the way for... Oh, absolutely. So we're pleased to see that Quite a lot of uh, organizations do have a special retiree pay band uh, or like fee band or whatever you would say. Now, ICON, you know, th- these are only accurate as of what I found on the websites today as well. So I'm guessing in the new financial year, which is, you know, next month, <laughs> uh, these may all change. So I apologize for this being out of date really, really quickly, probably. Uh, but uh, today, uh, in terms of uh, ICON membership, associate membership is £100. Uh, concessionary associate membership, uh, that's if you're on a lower income grade, is £85 per year. Student membership is £52 and supporter is 50 You can also join us an organisation for 370 So those are the kind of bands there. I do also know that if you're an accredited 
icon associate, then you do pay a lot more than this, but I don't know how much. So write in, let us know. Yeah. So I'm neither not really... of us are accredited. No. Clearly. Yeah, clearly. So um I don't know what the current accred- accredited uh membership fee is, but hey ho. For the AIC, the regular membership is about £106. That's $149. Students and retired people, it's about 50 quid, $71. And institutions can join for 168 quid or $235. So that's the kind of the kind of grades there. Uh, then we go into the Irish uh, iCry, in which case it's all in euros. So students, they pay €25, Euros, about £22. Uh, associate membership is 30 euros or about 26 pounds fully like con- like conservative restorers 50 euros that's uh, about 44 pounds and accredited conservative restorers are 100 euros or 88 pounds for natska oh my god natska is like the affordable <laughs> it's like the, the, oh the affordable option but to be like the, to, we should also mention that that's a specialist network so you, they would probably expect you to pay other membership fees on top of whatever you're already giving them right um so really uh, well why well say that you're a conservative you're probably a member of icon already and then you're also a member oh, of natska yeah so okay. so yeah it wouldn't make sense for them to want to charge you like you know a ridiculous amount because no, then you wouldn't be able it's to a afford sort of it an additional yeah, exactly. interest isn't it additional I mean, support i mean i could be barking up the wrong tree sorry natska uh but i i love your prices <laughs> individual membership is 20 pounds students uh or the unwaged 15 uh, and institutions can join for 40 that's a bargain yeah really good um museums association have different pay bands uh they vary quite a lot low income pay band is 80 pounds per year uh, medium is 133 and high can be anywhere between 190 and 218 so it depends on how loaded you are basically <laughs> Uh, students volunteers uh unwaged and retired people all get 56 pounds per year for mem- uh, membership fee and trustees can join for 75 it's got a lot of granular options and i really like that because it does take into account that people earn vastly different things in the museum sector uh, and then we've got the new zealand group unfortunately these numbers are from 2016 I, I just couldn't find the accurate information so i'm sorry if this is all wrong at the moment but in 2016 it seems like the full membership was 60 dollars 31 pounds concessionary or yes uh, i think was 35 dollars or 18 pounds and students were free oh my god amazing um nobody does that new zealand students get in there yeah i know right uh so i don't know if those if those numbers are still accurate um but i just thought i'd shout them out as a kind of comparison point of comparison so here we are kind of representing all sorts of organizations in all sorts of countries which is you know really good but yeah so the prices do vary quite a lot um depending on where you are but it will also depend on what kind of economies you're working in Mm -hmm. um that sort of thing so i'm not sure if uk might have slightly higher rates because the pound is stronger or because it's not that we earn more (laughs) (laughs) no it's not that i don't know i don't know either are there fewer institutions in in the uk no no the opposite i feel like there are loads to choose <laughs> oh well, well maybe that's... we just know about ours better that's that sounds yeah quite yeah lovely. yeah uh, okay all right next we looked at what uh everyone provides for the members so we asked what do you provide your members with like wh- why should they join you and some things that absolutely everyone as far as i can tell provided were a newsletter they they could be at varying kind of uh regularity like quarterly or monthly or whatever but everyone has a newsletter um Everyone seems to provide either training or reduced rates, like uh, a discount for training opportunities, voting rights, because most uh, of these organizations have some sort of, you know, uh, board or something that you need to vote people in on. Job alerts, that was quite common, uh, which is a lovely touch. Annual meetings, that's probably also a legal requirement, I think, of these organizations to always have like an annual thing. Uh, But that could just be a UK thing. Uh, Networking opportunities was also really common. And uh, recognition. Recognition. Oh, (laughs) suck a little badge of pride. Can I have a badge? Uh, (laughs) I don't get a badge. Get a card. Cards are all right. I do like my card. Yeah, cards are all right. I got two cards. Mm, Get you well. Spending all my money. (laughs) That's why I don't have any money. Uh, 
loads of people also provided some sort of specialist member publication. Now, I'm not meaning like a magazine, although loads of people did that as well, but something like, you know, studies in conservation, like that sort of thing, uh, okay. where it's like a slightly academic publication that only members like really have Icom access journal, to. The Icom yeah, 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 that's yeah. that sort of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Lo loads of these organizations also had specialist subgroups. Now, I know... I'm really interested in this it's one, yeah. well known, of course, to us at least, that ICON has subgroups that, mm -hmm. you know, you can join. And that seems to be quite a common theme amongst these um, various organizations, that you do have little subgroups that you can join. Not everyone was necessarily very detailed in what they are or anything, because I suppose it's only interesting if you live in Ireland, etc. Mm -hmm. But loads of people did have the specialist groups. I'm really interested in that because I think I'm a fan of it now because I'm in a slightly more um, specialised role and I'm sort of, I can kind of hone down on what I know I'm interested in. But I remember when I first signed up, to, I'm a member of ICON, and when I first signed up in my like first year, I can't remember if it was my first or second year of my degree, and I was looking at all these specialisms thinking, how on earth do I choose which one I like? <laughs> I'm I'm an objects conservator and that covers most most yeah. things. I don't want to, yeah. you know, where's organics? You know? Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And I feel like there are, yeah, <laughs> I'm totally with you because as a, as a new professional, absolutely impossible to know what you're going to choose mm -hmm. unless yeah. you already have a specialism. Like you only did textiles, so you're only ever going to work with textiles. Yeah. Then it's obvious what it's going to be. But I think objects conservators have a really hard time with trying mm. to pick what their specialist group should be. Yeah. Now you can join two and then have one as a kind of a freebie, like you're on the mailing list, but you don't really get any of the perks. I've joined five. Have you? Yeah. I, I don't was... think anyone's noticed. <laughs> I thought it was three. <laughs> Shh. Uh, you can join as many as you like. Because uh, <laughs> it depends Ma on... Michael Nels, just ignore this. <laughs> Oh God, what have I said? So it seems to me that <laughs> that it depends so much on the job that you're actually in. Because yeah, I, I, I have specialized reconfigured role. Yeah, mine. Exactly. Many I, times. I'm in a very specialized role doing textiles, but I'm also responsible for a massive collection of photographs. So I'm on the photographs mm -hmm. one. Yeah. And loads of paper so yep. i'm on the paper one and oh, yeah. ooh, i'm on the textiles one as well and right so you're on loads and of so groups. i'm on loads but um which means that i get a lot of emails all the time yeah but sometimes i feel like i just need to be on all of them and then i feel bad like i'm some sort of freak but actually well, I, I can't just... possibly attend everything what no obviously, <laughs> so, no, no, obviously. So, so i feel like <laughs> i'll just be one i'll just be kind of i feel like jack of all trades yeah, so i feel like specialist groups are good and I, they feel more useful now that i'm a bit established in my career mm -hmm. yeah definitely but i i also feel like i can't possibly fit in any in any mm -hmm. of them which mm -hmm. is kind of funny i mean i'm, I'm, yeah. I'm even on the committee in one of them yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know like i I I recognize that my job will always be so diverse that yeah. I will always, you know, need at least six of them, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah. Uh, it's, it just it just never quite works out as I I'm this and that's all I yeah. am. Never ever. Do we need like do we need a sort of middle ground? It's, it's membership a... of those groups so that you can have like a bit of all the stuff. Well, I mean, that it, sounds rubbish. It, yeah, it does a little bit. I don't know what the solution is, or if you could just say that no, you're allowed to be a, a formal member of more groups. But then I'm not sure that works either because I, yeah, I, I don't know what the solution is. No, but if anyone's listening from my icon, oh, this is a dilemma for objects. <laughs> Please think of us. <laughs> I don't uh, feel that I'm getting. I feel like in the in an effort to get as much as I can, I'm getting less than I would because I've kind of taken too big of a piece of pie, and I can't I can't cope. Anyway, but on the bright side, that means that the groups actually uh, do offer a load of they, things. They do. So that's yeah, good. they that's do. Really good. They really do. Okay, sorry. Back to your back to your list. Oh no, that, that's quite alright. But no, uh, specialist groups does seem to be a, a, a quite common thing. Mm -hmm. uh, that there, there's you know a pros and cons to everything. Uh, s uh, some things that only some people said they provide. I mean, you probably all of them provide it, but only some people said they did. So I'm going to bring them up. Social engagement. I loved this because it was kind of like, oh, you, you know, 
we have pub evenings and you know stuff Aww. like that and it was like oh i love that and like you know things like that so a couple of organizations said that they did more kind of social stuff that isn't necessarily hardcore networking but Which it's ones? more but it's more like uh i feel like um the new zealand ones the irish ones mm-hmm. and the swedish ones Aww. all mention kind of social events that weren't very worky mm-hmm. which i really appreciate i appreciate uh, but well. you know it's it's also really hard to pull off because yeah you know geographical distances and all that right some people uh, such as the uh, nordic and the irish professional body uh, said that they had some extra grants for members only yes. for things like travel and training and all that stuff so it might be that more people do that but they were the ones who pointed it out Several, Icon, I Cry, the Canadian Association and the New Zealand one, uh, also they had various listings or similar where people can find conservators and search for them, uh, which does seem to be a very core element of what they do so that people can actually find professional conservators. So so that's grand. And and those people were very proud of that. that it was oh, very, very it was much, very, yes. Much a central, oh, yeah, that, central that, that was thing definitely, that they did. Yeah, definitely a very core thing. Icon, I Cry, and the Canadians uh, all have accreditation schemes of their own. So they are the ones that do various kinds of accreditation. Now, they will probably look different in each country, but they do do accreditation for conservators. So some uh, organizations, uh, I Cry and ICOM especially, did say that they did non member events. Do know that technically you can go to say ICON events without mm-hmm. being a member and yeah. stuff like that. So, like, definitely more people do do it. And you can go to museums associations. Yeah, yeah, you can. Without... You, just yeah. Had, you just had to pay like a higher, mm-hmm. higher fee or something. So, we know that people do do that. And it is good to do because that way, even if someone can't afford to be a member, all the time they might be able to finance that one-off training event or talk that they want to go to yeah absolutely. so i think that's actually quite crucial uh, some people said things like we're there to give kind of government input and like advice on legislation people have access to tendering opportunities that you wouldn't have if you weren't a member the Muse- museums association and icom uh, both have free entry to various museums and exhibitions uh, because they I was are particularly interested in that <laughs> because they are you know more museum wide organizations so that makes perfect sense and and loads of people do quite enjoy that perk uh, most of the museums in the uk are free but you can get free entry to say special exhibitions for example the aic said they had uh, online forums for members which is something i really miss <laughs> Not that I it, think there is a decline in the forum, isn't there? Oh, definitely. I feel like there's mum's net and people asking about their health, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and yes. why is my car doing this? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I mean, you've got a bit of community going on on Reddit and stuff like that, but I do feel like there is perhaps not very many places to go and ask advice when you when you're like a lone conservator needing to talk to some people. Uh, but then I guess Facebook groups and stuff are kind Does of filling the disc that void. List count. I suppose that's... It, it kind of does, but it's not as organic because yeah. you have to email in and it's a bit more yeah. formal, so it's less likely to be very chatty. So in some ways, I kind of miss forums like that. But again, it's a dying breed, so ignore me. I'm just being nostalgic. <laughs> in my day, we always <laughs> exactly. had a forum. We all used to go on forums and have an avatar and everything was <laughs> lovely. <laughs> One of my favorite answers, though, for what they provide was Natska saying they provide support for their members. <sighs> Shockingly, no one else actually phrased it like that. <laughs> and actually, I just thought that I is the loveliest that. thing. Yeah. That's what I want to support. support. <laughs> I want support always. <laughs> so thank you, Natska. Yeah. So that's kind of a run through of what people said they do provide, mm-hmm. basically, mm-hmm. Uh, their members. Well, some of the phrasing is particularly mm-hmm. interesting and also the way that the way that different institutions provide their answers, the kind of language they used was mm. really interesting. Oh, yeah. Um, and the kind of, you know, you'd have the bigger bigger organizations with a really polished kind of document with, and it had been, you know, vetted. and Yeah, with the logo with and it's been very <laughs> official. And then bright and shiny. And, and then some people just email back with, oh, I'm happy to help you. And it's like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, obviously both is great. Oh, yes, obviously. Um, well, we appreciate these answers in any form that they came. Don't get us wrong. <laughs> it's just it's just nice to note that there are differences. 
Uh, we also asked people about what their organizational priorities were. Like, you know, ooh, are these different to their to what they provide? Their priorities versus what yeah, they provide? yeah, a little bit, yeah, a little oh, bit. Uh, I mean, yeah. So th- these were kind of. I feel like these ended up being more aspirational. Or we oh, aim to. You see, like oh, okay, we, we got a lot yeah. of that kind of answers. It, it became obvious that some people are more institutional than mm-hmm. individual based. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, for example, the Museums Association said very nice things like inspiring museums to change lives oh. and leading positive of change in the sector Aww. but you know and those are great things but they are obviously more based around museums as organizations yeah, yeah. as opposed to supporting museum workers uh-huh. which i suppose i do expect a slightly more member heavy focus on like from the conservation groups mm-hmm. for some reason and i don't really know why because some of them did point out that they're you know like conservation bodies not conservator bodies and that oh. we and that we shouldn't be confusing that what they're doing with like unions or that mm-hmm. sort of that yeah. sort of backing right and that is a fair point um but i do still feel like the conservation bodies are slightly more like membership focused like yeah. less about institutions need to do this and more about members should do this yeah. which uh, is okay. which i feel is just a slight shift it's not huge but uh-huh, a slight yeah. one I suppose it's what you're after, isn't it? Yes, as well. yeah, yeah, exactly. I think the really big themes that everyone mentioned were advocacy, so making people aware that conservation is a thing and raising the profile of mm-hmm. it and that sort of thing. Pretty much everyone said that, like that was yeah. that was a priority for them, and also promoting best practice, high standards, mm-hmm. making sure conservation standards are a known thing and that it's aimed for and all that. They were huge. Like they were like the big flashy keywords yeah. that everyone shouted about. And then we've got some like not outliers, but like some other ones. Natska and Icon both mentioned community. Like that they want to build Lovely. a yeah. community of people who can share their knowledge and skills. And that's great. It goes hand in hand with support. It does actually. Lovely. It does. Um and for example, Natska said increasing awareness of the value of natural history in museums. And uh, you know, that's that's so valuable and we do need that. Mm-hmm. So I guess I guess that's just kind of an offshoot because everyone else is trying to increase awareness of the value of conservation. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, they're just kind of parallels, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Uh, most groups also said things like skills development. They wanted their members to get the right training, be able to continue their professional development uh, and stay current in their skills. So that's really good. See, that's that's a member focus there. Mm-hmm. Like we want our members to be able to get training. That's really nice. I think yeah. that was it was good to see that such a kind of central yeah, goal. Yeah, absolutely. Really, really interesting. I really appreciate that. The AIC said uh, they wanted... Uh, to represent the conservation to the public. So they wanted to be like the public face of conservation, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. The New Zealand group uh, mentioned that they'd like growth. You know, like I think they were the only ones to mention that they'd like to grow their membership and grow as an organization. Mm-hmm. And I really like Icon mentioned engagement. Um, and I'm actually going to read out a bit of what they said because I feel like they phrased it much better than I could. We want to expand our membership to include all those who wish to support our work. It's important for us to build entryways into the sector and we're working hard with employers on the new apprenticeship uh, standards. Volunteers who are engaged with Care for Heritage should also benefit. Uh, so I feel like that that was good that it was trying to include kind of adjacent areas and kind of thinking about ways into the profession. That was really nice. Again, uh, the Nordic uh, Conservatives organization did say that they uh, that one of their core priorities was providing the government with advice on legal matters, mm-hmm. like you know le- legislation. That's you know they need the need us for that. I found that very interesting, and the ones that I noticed there that the, the, having an organization that represents you and that can speak for you, like a, yeah, a, a sort of. I feel like lobbying when it comes to legislation and stuff like that is is something that is really important mm-hmm. actually i suppose in the uk maybe we suffer from there are many organizations that already do that uh, i'm thinking yeah. rescue and you know all sorts of yeah uh, you know archaeology based ones heritage and ones he- well. yeah, yeah you know all the historic historic england and all of that mm-hmm, right mm-hmm. all of them already do that so maybe there's not as much room for icon there and uh, museum association obviously already do quite a lot of that so yeah, maybe that's just not the the room to expand into that there. I feel it has to do with although, who's listening and what they're listening about as well. Yeah, though. although we do respond to white papers and stuff like that from, yeah. by icon. So, mm-hmm. I mean, there is that. But yeah, so I, I found it interesting that the Nordic Conservatives, that was a core aspect yeah. of their work. 
encouraging national and international collaboration was also a core cool one uh, in their in their point of view. I I loved this from from the Canadians, which was uh, it was all about finding the competent people, letting people find the conservators needed to do the job. I really like that. That's straight to the point, isn't it? Yeah, it is, and it's it's such a it's so obvious. <laughs> it's so obvious that nobody else said it. <laughs> And and I really appreciate that they did say it because yeah mm. that is surely a point yeah and a priority. So one of the other questions we asked was, "What are your weaker areas slash where would you like to see more development?" So the largest institution, Icom CC, they would like more members from underrepresented countries and. Basically, that's, that's so nice, isn't it? Yeah. So they've they've identified that the problem that the, there is a problem of. Um, a lack of financial support for travel um, over oh, long yeah. distances. Oh, yeah, of course, because they do the triennial conferences, which are in exotic locations. Every yeah, time, exactly. Um, and I imagine, I mean, obviously, they're exotic to us, but, well, they're exotic to me because well, I'm yes. British and I never travel. Oh, yes. <laughs> so basically, I'm on this <laughs> tiny little island and I expect everybody to come to me. Ah, but, but <laughs> ah, technically, because they have it in a different place every year, they are exotic locations because they're never in the True, same location. True, but they're local to some. Oh, of course. So, yeah. So anyway, um, the problem of financial support for traveling long distances. Um, yeah, I was going to say I would never, ever, ever, ever be able to go to one of their conferences without a grant. Well, Melbourne as yeah. well. I really wanted to go to that. But it's, oh, I, I mean, they're great for the people in in oh, that we, neck of the oh, woods. Yes, so, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Yeah, I'm definitely. I mean, it's if anything, it's more democratic to move it around properly all the time. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's, yeah. that is the way to do it. Yeah. Um, especially since they come around every three years. So, uh-huh. you know. Yeah, you can save up. Yeah, exactly. So also an interesting interesting aspect of um, considering potentially different different priorities in uh, unstable economies as well so um, oh yeah so accepting essentially that you know if you think about the whole world that will encompass conservatives oh, yeah. from very many different yeah, that's true. countries and that's struggling with different point. things and stuff so i that's thought that was point, an interesting that's... global view. yeah that's where, where you can where you can really tell that's a properly international organization yeah, exactly. where they have to think well some what the conservator in kazakhstan is going to have very different thoughts on uh-huh. this matter yeah. than the conservator in japan and the conservator yeah. in norway yeah Exactly. Yeah. Very oh, interesting. Cool. So, um, yes, that was the largest one. The smallest, again, that I've taken is Natska. Um, or, or, We're not picking on your Natska. We love you. Yes. <laughs> uh, just in, as an example of a smaller institution, Natska would like to see... Um, they would like more staff to facilitate activities um, so that they can provide more training and events projects that That's a they've got in the running, answer. isn't it? Absolutely. And it's such a simple solution as well. That is obviously, you know, extremely difficult to solve, but it's, you know, yeah, you, but you, to do more stuff, you you need more people. Yeah. Kind of, um, and kind that's of straightforward. So, so relatable as well. Yeah. Definitely. So relatable. I yeah. can't imagine the number of you listening that must be sitting there thinking, yeah, if only I had eight of me, I could do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I could do my job. Yeah, that's how I feel at least. <laughs> Um, so ICRI, um, they would like to grow their profile in, com- in the cultural sector of Ireland um, and increase their member base. Uh, so a- a- AIC aim to develop their financial stability in the current economic climate, um, which I found really interesting because obviously of all the things that are going on at the moment. Um, oh, yeah. And you know, what? that's an interesting point because I feel like only about two of the organisations, mm-hmm. so AIC and Oh, I can't swear by who the other one was and probably don't feel like I should be outing them either. But I feel like about uh-huh. two organizations did say that they wanted financial resilience. Yeah, yeah. Like, really? So that's interesting because it's probably something that is actually a universal problem. But not everyone wants Yeah. Maybe not everyone people wants to. People don't talk about it. Yeah. Again, but... Or maybe it's, people. Or maybe maybe it's just one of those obvious things where it's so obvious that yeah. we're all struggling. So why uh, mention yeah. it, right? <laughs> yeah. So their 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 goals for this their uh, their approach to this I should say is increasing marketing outreach and fundraising um, for that and Icon um, I'm going to read out actually because I think they 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 um, said this in a really nice succinct way um, and it's not something that we saw elsewhere they want we want to find ways to mitigate financial barriers to participation whether that's becoming a member attending Icon events or getting accredited um, and I thought yes that's 
I think oh, of yeah. all the things that we could complain about in our sector and, oh, it's so difficult to participate in Icon because, oh, it's expensive. That's exactly it. And they know yep, they're they trying know to help. They're trying. That's good. It's That's, just that it's expensive. That so is really I, helpful, I really, actually. Yeah, yeah. I, really, I really appreciated oh, reading that. That was, that. That was really good. good. Yeah, mine too. Thank you, Icon. And they're hoping to do that through um, things like extended grants, uh, sorry, things like grants, bursaries um, to members, um, sponsored membership as well as something um, that they have seen working in the past that they might try and bring back. Um, And basically that sort of recognition that particularly for... um, particularly for emerging professionals it can be really hard um just to be a part of of professional organizations um, really really odd question that only just occurred to me uh-huh can you buy membership as a gift for someone <gasps> i don't know i'm just throwing that there i think it might be I a thing you... <laughs> that museums association does because oh, i feel right. like i've seen that around christmas <laughs> but i mean i know that this sounds like the most dull thing ever no i'm but... laughing because i thought oh you can for camera <laughs> The real ale place. I know you can buy. I wow. know you can buy that. But hey, that's such a good idea because you could have a like a proper gift pack, couldn't you? Where you, you could have actually. your membership, yeah, you the could. last two news articles. Yeah, you could actually. That would no, be cause, lovely. Because I'm thinking. Okay, right. I'm I'm thinking this with my emerging professionals hat on. But I kind of feel like if you've got like a, a doting grandmother <laughs> who like <laughs> wants to help you start in life, then a year's membership of ICO would be like amazing to receive. Uh, that's so. That's such a cute little idea as well. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. That's. Feel free to think. <laughs> But, you know, it's, it's, I'm just putting it out there. I think well, that's I nice. Like it. I like it. So in this room, in this room, it's a favourite. Yeah. In the studio, we like it. So um, back to what people um, would like to improve in or see development in. Um, NKFS. Would you like to say that name again, please, Jenny? Just, oh, uh, Nordisk Conservators for Bundet. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Uh, they would like to improve their marketing and uh, their, their marketing of the organization um, and reaching out internationally. So I think for probably lower population places, that's one of the things they that's really kind of um, a nice thing to do to kind of bring oh, yeah, lots of different people, lots of different absolutely. expertise in. Also, and I around say, and out, of course. Yeah, I must say the marketing angle, I feel like loads of these must struggle with that mm-hmm. because... Yeah, I do feel like, um, you know, that's part of the profile racing, though, isn't it? Just making sure that people know that places like Icon and AIC exist outside of conservation. Yeah. Uh, because sometimes, you know, when I talk to museum people, I mean, they barely know what a conservator is, <laughs> let, let alone that there's an icon. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and like, that's something to work on. So I feel like that must be something that all of these organizations have to solve, surely. Yeah, absolutely. The number of times I've said, I'm a conservator, what's that? I fix objects in museums. <laughs> and then the interest kicks in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, NZCCM, um, their professional development, they'd like to improve their professional development. Um, and this was really sweet. Um, professional development was theirs um, because they are geographically isolated. Their access to training is um, understandably limited because everything's comparably far away um does this mean i can get to go to new zealand and provide training (laughs) (laughs) you've just come back come on (laughs) i know i've just been there i want to go back (laughs) Um, and they would love for more international conservators and experts to visit um in that respect so i think every basically we should just all flock there because it's nice (laughs) oh and to work of course oh yeah. (laughs) yeah work really hard um CAPC um they would like to make their accreditation process more transparent um mm-hmm. and to increase the profile of CAPC to employers such as museums and galleries um and their first step towards this goal has been to revamp their website so check that out if you're interested mm. we'll provide links to everyone by the way so yeah i found those ones but the, the answers to that really yeah kind of were really interesting was probably self-reflective more, yeah probably more overlap than people realize yeah Definitely. Everyone's struggling a bit with something and it's very often the same thing. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're listening for one of these organizations, then maybe you maybe you can help uh, help someone out and like reach out and suggest something that you've tried very successfully and that, that they might be struggling with. Just saying. Sharing is caring. Aww. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, so um, the the other one of the other questions um, that I thought would be a really nice thing to to assess um, was the attitude. I think it was the, the question I came up with actually because um, I thought it would be really edgy and and, and interesting. Um, Ooh! I know, and it was the um, what are your attitudes to non members essentially or conservatives who oh, choose yes. not to become members of your organisation? And actually, it was all really inclusive and nice and everyone everyone said that all of their events were open to non-members and that there were the things they could access well, actually not edgy at all because everyone was really, really lovely, lovely. <laughs> Aww, yeah, so, thanks um, everyone group hug group yeah, hug, group hug. so that's that's me for the negative bits the the things that i tried to catch people out on <laughs> which, which didn't i didn't work <laughs> i didn't i just thought there'd be interesting questions one yeah. of the questions we asked um, was, "What makes you special? What is it that you're proudest of? Uh, what makes what is it that you think makes you really sort of shine in the in the um, the group of the professional bodies? Because as we said, there are loads of them. So I'm going to read out some short little little bits here um, of what people found were their their best their best points." ICOM CC was their relationship with full museum community over the whole world, which I think is quite a sort of bam. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Drop bike. Yeah, okay. That's yeah. a pretty good one. Yeah, well done. Well done there. Um, ICRI are the only organization open to private and public conservators in Ireland. Um, AIC are proudest of their membership base in the Americas and their online resources are proudest of their online resources. Mm. Um, ICON own the accreditation standard, as we know, um, and they represent all the disciplines through the different specialist groups that we discussed earlier. NKFS um, have a grant foundation scheme uh, and a newsletter. And NZCCM, are, the, their operations are focused around their connection with cultural materials um, and the awareness, support and respect is central to their operation, um, which is it's in the name, isn't it? And of course, in New Zealand, you've, that's, oh, yeah, and that's central to everything. Yeah. And they did also mention that they really incorporated, you know, core ethics to do with mm-hmm. Maori cultural yeah, objects. You know, they, they were really really on it with the ethics they were they were good yeah and an example i'm sure you all are but but they're certainly an example and very interesting institution as well um capc are proudest of their um, unified shared code of ethics um as as accreditation is a very hot topic with them particularly i think that's that's really that's really a deep deep part of what they do um museums association finally didn't state one so um i'm gonna i'm gonna give you one um (laughs) they are the oldest membership organization in the world um as they presumably um, for museums and heritage yes yeah yeah yeah. oh yeah yeah, yeah. as they were founded in 1889 that's very nice yeah yeah so i think that's a really nice thing and i suppose it's that's another reason why they are so embedded in in different yeah, been around different attitudes really different time. heritage yeah. sectors because they've been around for the longest yeah um and they do provide a great sort of overview of heritage operations in this country don't they yeah. so that's interesting because like um i've been a member of let's see what have i been a member of i've been a member of um, Museum Association, ICON, and IIC, which we, we didn't get any responses from IIC, so we haven't been talking about them. But you know, they're also a valid, good option. <laughs> just like not writing on them. That's, other other we, professional bodies are we, available. <laughs> we just couldn't discuss just them. Them. <laughs> uh, We just couldn't discuss them. Um, and uh, I feel like at the beginning of our career, I feel like Museum Association was probably more helpful to me because oh, yeah. I feel like they some of their training and workshop is so workshops that's so diverse that it gave you some unique selling points yeah uh like knowing a little bit about copyright and mm-hmm. how to use social media in museums mm-hmm. that those were really selling points for me yeah. in my first few jobs they also have quite a lot of free events and they and the and free aspects to their conferences as well they do yes which is nice because it's quite expensive to go to the actual yeah. conference but the free bits are really good yeah and similarly i, I would say that they're training if you're a student isn't too bad um like in terms of price uh it does quickly get a bit pricey Mm -hmm. once you're like you're supposed to be a properly paid person um (laughs) 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 um uh but i feel like in my early years they were really helpful Mm -hmm. so i thought it was very much worth it because when i talk to conservatives now the uh, reaction tends to be why would you why would you be a member of the museum association but actually i feel like it connects me with the sector yeah um and 
for me that's important i get that loads of people aren't into that loads of people just want to do their thing and like have their little click around them and but i want a huge click <laughs> <laughs> i want to jump around in everyone's ball pit i just want to ah, <laughs> i, I want to play in everyone's playground oh my god this is fun um I want to stay connected to what's going on, uh, even if it's not specialist. Like, yeah, I, I guess yeah. I just want, I, I like being part of the wider community. Um, <laughs> I love how red faced you are with laughing. <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, as for now, now that I'm a bit more established, I feel like um, uh, I'm much more into what Icon is offering. Yeah. In terms of specialist workshops mm -hmm. and talks and stuff like that. And that's now much more useful mm. to me. Um, Which is interesting because I feel like in this country, at least, Icon is kind of very important to be seen to be a member of when you're starting out. Like it's yeah. the kind of thing that you're a member of so that people know that you're serious about your career. Yeah. Um, and I think that can you can say I think you could say that for a lot of the bodies that if you are a member of a professional body, employers can see that you are invested, invested mm. and you are. Um, actively seeking professional development, even if you're at student level or if you're unemployed or that sort of thing. Um, but I did feel <clears throat> myself, at least, that Icon was one of the things I had to do. Um, and in some, in one instance, I think I became a member just before I applied for a job so that I could say I was a member of Icon because yeah. it was that level, even though I couldn't afford it at the time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, anyway, it is hard because starting out, you don't have a lot of money no. so because you've given it all away to university. <laughs> um, yeah, so it is hard. Uh, and it is hard to know which bits you should afford um, and how much and how much employers care. Because, mm, I mean, yeah. so, some employers care very much. That and you, some care not at all. Yeah, exactly. And it really does depend. And some people just slap the, you must be on the pathway to accreditation thing on on the job descriptions because they think it belongs there, not mm -hmm. necessarily because yeah. they actually value it. So it really varies. I mean, I like professional organizations. I think they do good things. And even at the toughest times, I have stayed a member, even if, even when it would have been a really bad idea. <laughs> I'm not proud of that. Um, uh, but yeah, so I mean, I do think they are important, but it is also important that the professional bodies know that people struggle. Mm -hmm. Because obviously every year membership fees do go up because they are just for inflation, unlike our pay. Um, <laughs> just saying. Um <laughs> Uh, so i mean it's it's important to be aware that people do struggle and try to help them out just yeah. any way you can which some of you are doing which is really, oh yeah really nice to hear which again. i think really came through in your answers um and yeah i i think i think you're all you know generally doing good things for us as a profession uh as a heritage sector uh so yeah keep up the good work guys it's great and thank you very much yeah thank you i, I hope to see more good work from you all no pressure <laughs> keep it up Thank you so much to everyone who responded to us. Special thank you to Alison Richmond and Michael Nels from Icon, Errol Wentworth from AIC, Louise O'Connor from uh, ICRI, uh, Paolo Viscardi and Lucy Mascord from Natska, Becky Halliwell from uh, NZCCM, Alistair Brown from the Museums Association, Lisen Tam from Nordiska Konservators for Sverige, Fiona Graham from CAPC, uh, and also Greg Hill from the same, and Renata Peters from ICOM CC. Thank you all so much for your time and dedication for answering these questions. Today I'm reviewing Authenticity in Transition, Changing Practices in Art Making and Conservation. Edited by Irma Hermans and Francis Robertson. It was published in 2016 by Archetype Publications. These are the proceedings from a conference held at the University of Glasgow back in 2014, but the topic is still as relevant now as it was then. The papers collected in the softback book deal with a range of topics, such as artist intent, uh, how we measure value of art, and the role of conservators in modern art. Some papers are a little bit on the artsy side, by which I mean they feel like they were written for art historians and critics, rather than someone simply wanting to learn more about art conservation challenges. This is a language and jargon issue, and it doesn't actually reflect on the quality of the content. But I did prefer reading the slightly more accessible papers. 
I'd immediately urge you to let go of any notion that art conservation in this book is about paintings. There are a few paintings, but this book offers a very broad range of art types. Collaborative art made by members of the public for special events, uh, audiovisual installations, sculptures, uh, full room installations and online net art. The spectrum of challenges represented is actually really impressive. While the central theme of this book is authenticity, what this means and how it can be upheld, there are many other great questions in these papers. Some of my favourites were, is the intent of the artist or the wishes of the curator more important? Does intent, i.e. the function and meaning of the artwork, trump the materials used to make something? How do you conserve art made by living artists respectfully? And what are the legal ramifications of altering art through conservation? I really enjoyed the range of topics presented and a lasting impression from the book is that contemporary art conservation is possibly less science and more intuition. It's not all about keeping the bits and stabilising surfaces. It's much more complex than that. Um, I really liked it and I don't often work with contemporary works of art but it was a refreshing read. I also appreciate that papers uh, came from not only huge museums, but also from small galleries and large-scale restoration projects. Uh, it was a really good mix. These papers do discuss conservation strategy, but this isn't a how-to book. This is much more about an approach or an attitude than about step-by-step -step treatments. After all, that won't help anyone unless you're working on exactly the same piece, after all. Basically, I really recommend this book for anyone who does want to know a bit more about the challenges of art conservation. It's really interesting and a good read, even if it's not something you usually work with. This book has 205 pages, full colour illustrations, and at the time of recording, it costs £37.50 uh, from uh, Archetype Publications. We'll pop a link to it in the show notes. As usual, we welcome any comments, questions or corrections you have, so feel free to get in touch. Thanks for listening. With The Sea Word, and you'll be listening to Chloe Ramsey and me, Jenny Mathiasen. Join us next time for an episode about churches. In the meantime, check out our website at theseaword.show tweet us at the seaward podcast or simply email us on the seaward podcast at gmail.com the intro and outro music is spring by dd music and used under a creative commons attribution license additional music and sound effects by callum robertson this has been a wooden dice production Excellent.